Und ich beginne mit der Einführung von Herrn Gläsen. Er vertritt die Kunst des Engineering von Maxon Motors. Er hat in Tübingen Physik studiert an der Technischen Universität München, das fortgesetzt. TUM, Sie kennen das, was das wirklich heißt, was Sie glauben, die University of Munich. Und ist dann natürlich, wo sonst, in München bei Siemens gewesen und von dort zur ABB gegangen, bis er dann in Alp nach 2001 das CSM Dependance aufgebaut hat und von dort dann 2007 zu Maxon Motor nach Sachsen gegangen ist. Dort leitet er Research and Development und ist Mitglied der Direktion. Der Vortrag wird in Englisch stattfinden. That's why I switch in uh, bad English now. Uh, when you when when you are, when you are privileged uh, to to drive a good car, I'm not talking about my car. If you're privileged to, try, to drive a good car, um, then you will experience with the modern cars that if you if you leave the precise track and if you touch the white line on the right side or on the left side, that your steering wheel does suddenly shock you a little bit. So, uh, and you are not sure, did you hit uh, um, a wild boar or something like that? No, that's not, not uh, so, uh, so hard, but uh, you, you feel something. And then I said, uh, how the hell do, are, they, are they going to do that? I mean, uh, uh, did, did I drive over something? Obviously not. And then I started testing, of course. So that's fun. So uh, what, was, what was the amount of uh, rattling in the, in, the, in the steering wheel that I got? And then I suddenly got aware that, that probably the steering wheel is not directly any more connected to the, to, the, to the wheels in the front or in the back or whatever. It does some steering. It is, it's connected to a computer. So what I, I'm driving by a joystick. And the joystick comes back to me and said, hey, stupid, it's a white line. You're probably leaving on the left and the left side. And because uh, talking to me is tedious, as you have may have experienced, uh, so they do it with rattling in the steering wheel. So that's the easiest way to and for that you need very precise very small very efficient motors these guys are able to produce these things but not only for earth also for mars looking forward to a lecture thank you very much professor volkerts herr präsident ladies and gentlemen Driven by precision, this is the Maxon motto, and I want to talk to you today a little bit about applications on Earth and on Mars. Let me just make a comment to the steering wheel. This application, a rattling motor, that's the only application I know where noise of a motor is accepted. Normally, noise is unwanted. And it uh, it's very important whether you have a wooden steering wheel or a different steering wheel, it makes a different noise. And the automotive manufacturers, they, won't allow, they will not allow that the noise uh, can be heard by the person next to the driver. So this simple application contains some very tough requirements. But by now I have to say, that also this application is in the hands of our Asian competition. When things become commodity, then a Swiss manufacturer is no longer the manufacturer of choice. But there are other applications, I can assure you. I will talk about man, machine and robotics, small electric motors, this is what we are doing, our business, and applications. And first of all, Small electric motors, how on earth do they matter? Yeah? The electric motor was invented uh, quite some time ago, 180 years, let's say. It's not quite clear who invented the electric motor. One of them was certainly Jacobi in St. Petersburg. With this motor, he was running a boat with 11 people on the Neva River. So this motor had some power at that time. But after all, the motors which came later, they are a piece of electromechanics. No semiconductors, no sensors, little software. So why bother about this device? 
And the answer to that is we have to bother because the need for automatic motion, for electric motion, now is everywhere in the world. And the machines get smaller. They are no longer the big machines or 100 years ago, big transmission belts in the factory. Machines get smaller and smarter. Miniaturization is certainly one of the big global trends, not only in semiconductor physics, also in drive technology. And then there is the rise of the robots. And this will come. And here is one. It's from the Korea Institute of Advanced Technology. The Asians like to make the faces very human-like. So there is a rise of the robots. Man and machine. When you are in Switzerland, it was a recent topic. We had the so-called Cybertron in Zurich, where people with artificial limbs entered various competitions. And these artificial limbs, they need motors, of course. And here you see again the inventor of a robot, and the robot also looks very human-like. So at the Cybertron, you saw exoskeletons. These are walking aids. Here you have a walking aid, and you uh, sit into this uh, type of chair, and this walking aid needs strong motors in the knee and in the hip. These are the most powerful joints in the human body you can have. And we have to have here our most powerful motors. But you also need dynamics, because walking should not be slow, as it actually still is today, Walking should be fast. Rehabilitation. We have seen that also in the big television broadcast last week. Uh, some Zurich companies are here in, in front of the technology. When people have suffered a stroke or paralysis, then this is a training device. And this training device also contains motors. And safety is very important here. You don't want the motor to injure the patient. But the, actually, the driving force behind robotics is the aging of the population, age 60 plus. You see age 60 plus, the development of the population in Japan, in Switzerland, and in Germany. And you see, especially in Japan, you have a big increase of people over age 60. So in 2050, 41% is predicted. So what do these people do when they are alone at home? They need elderly care. And here is some robot. The robot might bring uh, coffee or breakfast. But for that, the robot has to walk safely. And walking, as we can do it for a robot, is still a difficult thing. And inside these robots are many motors to move the joints. And the robots enter into the family. Here you have a robot called Pepper. It's from a French company which was bought by a Japanese bank. And Pepper is something like a, uh, a mobile device. It's like your mobile phone. You can communicate with Pepper. It's a teaching device. And there are also other robots by this company, like the Now robot, for the children to play with them. So robots will enter the family and have entered the family already. Another driving force, of course, is manufacturing. Robotic, automatic manufacturing. And what is a development of recent times is soft robotics. Normally, these robots, they have some sort of cage protection around it, because in the past, you can easily get hurt by an abrupt, uncontrolled movement of the robot. But in soft robotics, there are devices and means to protect the robot from, from doing any harm to the person interacting with the robot. So the robot is an assist device, is assisting people to help do a manufacturing process. And since we are living in the age of miniaturization, we also have desktop robots, 30 centimeters, standing on a table. You see the motors here. You have you see three arms here, and this robot actually is pushing some buttons, but you can easily imagine that for micro-assembly, for assembling small devices, such a robot is much more efficient than a huge robot, 
which is in the automotive industry. Robots need motors. However, as Andy Weiner says, powered robots, robots with motors, need too much power. And that's the reason that he is using just balancing for, for walking. So what we need are efficient motors, motors Wirkungsgrad, motors which have a high efficiency, 80%, 90%, and this is the big advantage of electric mo motors. They have this efficiency in larger devices, but also, I will show that to you, in smaller devices. Of course, for robot design, you need also intelligent system design and software design. You need hardware and software. I'm talking today about motors, and I will leave a little bit away this aspect here. How can you get efficiency? One way is to invent a new winding. This invention is now uh, a couple of years old, actually 50 years old. In a standard winding, the winding is on so-called metal slots. It's a slotted design. So this is an ordinary motor for a toy. But you can imagine making the winding like a hollow shaft. And then you get rid of the losses you have inside these metal sheets. And in such a way, you achieve 90% efficiency and more in small devices with a diameter of 10 millimeter, 20 millimeter. This is, these are our typical measures. And here is such a device. It's not that beautiful uh, like a Swiss watch, of course, but it has some beauty inside. Uh, you have a gear head here, you have the motor, and you have a sensor here being able to locate where the rotor of the motor is standing. Now, what does a motor do? For this type of motor, you need this gray thing inside. It's a very strong magnet, a rare, a rare earth magnet. And inside the so-called air gap, you have the winding. And then you push a current through the winding, and inside the air gap, inside the magnetic field, there will be a force, and the force will turn the shaft of the motor. So electrical energy is being transformed into mechanical energy, and torque is a typical measure for the strength of such a motor. And when you add a planetary gearhead, you can also make the torque stronger. And now you see you have a few requirements here which ask for precision. This air gap is one-tenth of a millimeter. The shaft has to be very precise. You don't want noise. So the shaft will be even, as, will be even tolerated in the micron range. The gears here, Zahnräder, they have to be very precise. The ball bearings, the flanges. You don't want any noise of th from such a motor. And the motor is turning fast. These small motors, typical diameter 20 millimeters, they run up to 30,000 turns per minute. And if you leave away the brushes for commutation, make a brushless motor, you can do that. Then commutation is being done in the control system. You will reach speeds uh, as high as 100,000 rounds per minute or 500,000 rounds per minute. And you don't want any noise, you don't want any vibration. And you want to have this motor live for a long time. You don't want to change your steering wheel in your car every second week or so. So from such a small motor, the request for quality, for precision, is quite high. In the next slide, or in the next uh, description, you have these parts I, I spoke about, the sensor for positioning tasks, the commutator system for motors with brushes is a mechanical precision device. Uh, then the shafts, the rare earth magnets, the ball bearings, the gears, the long life brush here, the copper thing, the flanges, and the winding, which has to be balanced for a smooth running. So this is our daily requirement at Maxon to manufacture such a motor in an excellent quality because our motors are certainly uh, the more expensive motors in the world, 
and the customer, of course, is asking quality from us. So that's what Maxon is doing every day. It's the po po our product portfolio. It's very focused. You have families of motors, brushed motors, brushless motors. You have families of gearheads. You have families of control system. That's all. We are not doing the instruments that these our customers are doing. We are not doing the cars. We are doing the motors for the steering vibration. This is our everyday task, and we are doing about 12,000 variants of these motors every year. We have a thick catalog, but the customers do not order what is in the catalog. Every customer wants a speciality, a special drive for his purposes. Manufacturing, a core competence for Maxon, all these processes having to do with metals and welding and soldering. It sounds very trivial, but to achieve quality, this needs uh, many recipes which have grown over the years. Now I come to some applications. From the robots, I come to surgery robots. I mean, this is uh, the famous Da Vinci robot. You have one close to Engelberg in Lausanne and it enables the, uh, the doctors to have operations on the patients, surgery operations on the patients with a very high precision. Then there is the field of drug pumps to insert medication into the body and for diabetes patients um, there is a huge market for insulin pumps um, you have them on the body and in such a way you can have a more normal life. But of course the precise amount of insulin which you inject, this has to be very precise and for that you need an encoder to have a definite movement of the motor in very tiny steps. Implantable devices, implantable drug pumps with very small motors we are manufacturing motors as small as four millimeter in diameter, four millimeter. And these are ideal to be implanted inside the body, but you have to check about the material. The material has to be biocompatible and uh, you have to fulfill the uh, norms of the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA regulations. And this is a huge field, but this field is developing because in such a way you can cure illnesses of patients, you can help them to live longer. A very complete, a completely different field is heavy industry, oil and gas, downhole drilling. Maybe recently it has come to a little stop in this field, but for quite some time it was uh, for us a very important business because down there in the ground you have very high temperatures, 200 degrees. And not for drilling, but for controlling equipment, valves down in the drilling hole. You need motors being able to sustain 200 degrees ambient temperature. And imagine with the winding, the winding has a glue on top, and all these delicate uh, precision mechanical parts, this temperature is not so easy to reach, but we have motors in the catalog fulfilling these harsh environment requirements. Formula One. People are changing from hydraulics to electrics in the motor, in the engine design. So for that you need tough motors. There are a lot of vibrations on the Formula One track. And imagine if a motor fails in this case and the race is on Sunday, you can be sure you have on Monday 8 o'clock you have these people at your doorstep asking for a replacement and for an error correction. So a very tough and demanding industry. Aerospace, again, going from hydraulics to electric drives, more efficient, a growing market. And electromobility, there are lots of city bikes, but there's also a Maxon bike. Actually, it's a retrofit bike drive, and the motor is a very strong motor here in the wheel hub at the rear wheel. And I can tell you it's very strong, you have to be very careful when on a slippery road in rain you turn on the gas zug, then uh, it's a very fast motor. 
And it's uh, wanted by some people to have a challenge in the mountains to be able uh, not to go to the mountains by an ordinary mountain bike, but you are assisted by an electric motor, but it still has to have some sportive uh, association, some sportive note. And last application, are tattoo machines. Uh, I was surprised that this has turned into a market, I mean for us, but here uh, the people doing the tattoos, they are very sensitive. They are trying various motors and they are choosing, some of them choose Maxon, yeah, because they find, well, these motors, they are very strong and um, I can do my, my work better with these type of motors. And certainly some people are going to the limi limits here Young people uh, like to have tattoos. You have seen that in, in football, football games. So it's, a, it's again a growing market, but it might change. Now all this comes from Maxon Motor in Sachsen Obwalden. So here is Maxon Motor, right in the middle of the Alps. A thousand people work here. The company has 2,000 people in total. So we have to ask some questions. Why, why the hell Maxon? Why Obwalden? And why a high-tech company far away from Zurich, Basel, and Geneva? So for, for people from China, this might not seem important because uh, they're used to different distances, also the US. But in Switzerland, of course, this is a topic and a question which is always asked. I cannot enter into this. This would be a whole talk in itself. But the origins of our company go back to Braun Razor Company in Frankfurt. And uh, more than 50 years ago, Braun wanted to set up a business in Switzerland, and the production was directed to Obwalden by the Swiss Confederation. Confederation. So Braun was not allowed to set up a business in Zurich. It was directed to actually to uh, three places, and they chose Obwalden. We are privately owned. We have long-term goals. This was 50 years ago in Sachsen, the first building. And one of our most important genes is continued innovation. Continuous innovation is in our genes. This is what we are striving at. And it has been brought in by the people doing the razors first, and then it has been carried further by, by younger generations. So today we are quite a large company. We are still privately owned. Karl Walter Braun is still the principal shareholder since 50 years. We have 2,200 employees worldwide, 400 million revenue, 80% export, production sites in Switzerland, Germany, Hungary, and since a couple of years in South Korea to be closer, closer to the Asian market. And we spend 7% and even more of our revenue for R&D. I think this is not bad, but this is needed. This is needed to have continuous innovation. And I will close with a couple of slides because for quite some time, Maxon actually was not known, was only known in the community. But with this mission, the NASA Mars mission of 2004, there were two rovers which landed, Spirit and Opportunity. We became suddenly known. And the reason is that uh, Maxon was very predominant in this robots, 39 motors, the driving system, the mast, the mast, the antenna mast. And the requirement at that time was, and still is on the mast, you have to sustain plus 20 degrees to minus 120 degrees every Mars day. Normally, it's, it's the other way around. Devices in industry, they have to last from 100 degrees until minus 20 degrees. So here, it's the other way around. And this, we had been asked by NASA. And at that time, we didn't really know whether we could fulfill this. But uh, the salespeople, they reacted uh, in the right way. They said, we will look into it. And we looked into it, and actually, uh, the motors worked. These are the Mars motors of 2004. 
And the mission was supposed to last for 90 days, 2004. And one of the rovers is still running, Opportunity, still running on Mars, 16 years, yeah? 12 years, sorry, 12 years. How can that be? So this was a big advertisement for Maxon. Uh, the second rover, Spirit, is also running by way of motors, but it's stuck in the ground. On Mars, you have to be very careful because you have a soft ground and you can easily get stuck. I will show a few pictures. Here you have a nice animation. I mean, you see opportunity, but it was not photo photographed by Spirit. It's an animation inside, but I think the Victoria crater, this is a real photograph. And from on top of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, you can see opportunities, you can see rover tracks going along Victoria Crater. This is Victoria Crater, here are the traces. And the rovers, they move very slowly, a meter a day or so. They are being moved very carefully. And these are intelligent devices, because here you can see, I hope you can see that, there's a bent curve, there are tracks here, because there are rocks on this side. So the intelligence in these machines works. It's, I think, of course, assisted by the operator in the headquarter. And then you also see the dust devils here. We have to wait a little bit. Here is one dust devil. I mean, the sand storms on Mars. And they are, of course, not very favorable for devices working or running on Mars. And you have to cope with these dust devils on the Mars surface. So later, American missions also used other motors than Maxon motors. But there is a very large mission to be started in 2018. It's called ExoMars. And as you know, the search for water and life on Mars is predominant. And for that, there is a drilling unit. And now for this type of drill drilling, you can use our motors. They are in the exact power range which is needed. And you drill into the ground, hoping to get some water and hoping to find also life in this water. And for that, there is a laboratory on board. So all sorts of devices. Uh, Professor Günther from yesterday, he will be delighted. He could use his instru instruments to make uh, an analysis about the elements here in 33 microseconds that it was, was, uh, he was telling us. And there is a whole rock laboratory on board of ExoMars. And for all these things, you need a lot of motors. Thank God. You need for drilling the motors, motors. You need for driving motors. Here, there's a drive unit. It contains a motor, a first gear, and a second gear producing enough torque. These rovers, they run uh, very slowly, but they need uh, a lot of torque. And then uh, you have the, the rock laboratory inside. Uh, with many motors for doing the analysis, for moving the parts and the antenna mast, of course. So we are looking forward to this mission, 2018. We hope everything works well. And we will get to know more about Mars. A very nice photograph actually taken in 2007 by Rosetta satellite. You see the red soil. Uh, where the iron oxide uh, makes the color. You see the white pole caps. They change over the year, and it's frozen carbon dioxide. And the rovers normally land in the middle of the planet in uh, some terrain which is easily controllable. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. You, great talk, of course, as expected. Um, you were mentioning the, the Chinese or Asian competition. Yeah. How uh, long, I mean, other than on Mars or these special applications, but in most of your applications, how long of a, of a lead time do you have? How much time do you have in those markets before these guys come in and take them over? Or are there markets that they will never be able, or for a long time not be able to? In the steering wheel case, we had three years. And 
with the robots, it can be different. Because, uh, I mean, we are Maxon Motor, and we are known for motors, but as I have shown, we also have control systems. And for a robot, we could also deliver complete drive units. And whenever you can put electronics into your product, then you have a better protection. And this is the way we are going in the future. But we, I mean, the Chinese, uh, we heard it yesterday, there are so many students, intelligent students, and the motors of the Chinese and the Asians, the motors get better. Japan, for instance, is, uh, is the country of excellent motor manufacturers. So Asia for us is a test ground. Yeah? We have about 70 sales people in China, 40 sales people in Japan. We can afford that and we are making business. The business in all Asia is uh, approximately 50 million. So this against the strong competition is not so bad. Uh, I have a question regarding battery technology, because for all these motors yeah. you need stored energy. So does this match with your development of, of motors? Uh, let's take the bicycle case, uh, Maxon Bike Drive. Here the battery is a Chinese, Chinese manufacturer, uh, which is a little bit of a contradiction, but this is how it is at present, and we are going to change that. But the plans, about the plans, I cannot tell you uh, concrete steps right now. But uh, batteries are important for us. The high efficiency of the motors is especially needed when you have battery-driven devices. There you need the last percent of the efficiency because you want to live with your battery for a long time. Yeah. Well. Which kind of limitations do you see in the future? Uh, you have <coughs> shown um, temperature borders, limits. Uh, you've shown uh, bigness or uh, micro limits. Which, which are, where, up, up to where can you go with uh, motors? If it comes to small motors, I should say four millimeter or three would be the end of such a rotating machine using electromagnetic principles. But below that, there are other technologies. There is piezo effect, piezo drives. Uh, piezo drives you can use for movement in the nanometer range, in the nanometer range. Uh, there are electrostatic principles. There are other principles. So our technology, to generate enough torque, this would mean a motor three millimeters in diameter. For the larger motors, you can use conventional motors. Large motors have very high efficiency. So motors, big machines, like ones from ABB. Here you do not have the problem with the efficiency. So we are tackling the range in between for instruments like uh, medical devices, like laboratory automation. This is the range where our motors uh, work best. Limitations um, often is lifetime. People do not want to spend a lot of money on motors, so they want brushed, ordinary brushed motors with graphite brushes. But for that you reach lifetimes of about 6,000 hours. So if you're using this in a, an expensive laboratory device, which should last 20,000 hours or longer, then you have a bit of a problem. So this is uh, our everyday life and our talks to the customers to find the proper solution. You are uh, producing rotating motors. Are you also working on uh, artificial heart machines? Uh, which are not rotating, would not be rotating, but pumping devices. Yeah, but uh, they are also rotating. Are yeah. uh, because a pump is being driven by a rotating motor. You need, of course, some, some pumping device. 
like, uh, like an accentor or something like that, a membrane, and this goes closely together. There you are... Not, you did, yeah, yeah. Sorry. sorry? You did not talk about materials. So what is so going on in your lab at the moment, if you can say that? Materials. So uh, let's say magnetic glasses, ceramics, uh, you have the smoother surface, blah, things like that. So if you have stronger magnets th than the ones we have, I take them. Because okay, the stronger the tomorrow. magnet, yeah. it's, it's of an advantage to us. So nanomagnets could be a topic, yeah. but uh, we are engineering. So we, we are not working on nanomagnets ourselves. Here we work together with universities. We are following the trends there. So uh, stronger magnets are a topic for us. But also um, materials like ceramics. Ceramics has some advantage over steel. I think we might hear this later on. And uh, so materials New materials uh, is something we are looking at, and I think the, the biggest revolution could be the additive manufacturing. The three-dimensional printing of materials. Mm -hmm. To print a motor, you have to print a magnet first, of course. Printing a motor, additive manufacturing, I think this might be of, of uh, utmost importance to us because often we deliver one or two or 10 motors we we'll deliver small quantities of motors, and additive manufacturing might, might be the right technology for that, for that choice. So. Das heißt, wir sollten jetzt in Logistikunternehmen äh, investieren. Logistik? Ja, die, 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 die Sachen zum Printen müssen ja irgendwo herkommen. Uh, Wenn Sie einen lokalen 3D-Drucker yeah, haben yeah. und ich drucke bei mir zu Hause Aha. meinen Maxon-Motor aus, dann muss ich das ja mit irgendwas machen. Ja, dann muss ich, ich vorher bei der Post Neodympulver bestellen und äh, okay. äh, was auch immer ich für den Magneten brauche. Aber wir kaufen uns den Drucker selbst. Ja? Wir nehmen Ach, nicht, Sie kaufen den wir Drucker? Wir kaufen das ah, nicht okay. von Ihnen. Okay. <lacht> um, I'm a bit sensitive to the environment, so my question is... Um, do you have any, or do you have, a, uh, sorry, do you have any considerations on the environmental factor during the maybe manufacturing of the motors and the additives? This is a very good question. Uh, two answers to that. The problem of recycling of motors. I mean, motors, they have a finite lifetime. They have metal inside rare earth metals inside. The recycling is still at the beginning. It's very difficult to establish the recycling supply chain. So I'm afraid here we are still at the beginning and most of the motors they will be, well, they will be uh, just taken as a piece of metal and, and distributed in several parts. So recycling is a big issue and power cons consumption in our ma manufacturing too we have a photovoltaic uh, device on top of our roofs, so we are, and we are controlling uh, the amount of water we are using. So in that respect, we do what every good Swiss company does. We have uh, an environmental reporting uh, every year, and we are looking on that. Yeah. But recycling is still in the infancy. <laughs> 